welcome to the St. Michael Fall podcast series. My name is Christian Basil and I will be leading our meditation today. Our theme this fall is building our future. This is a unique time in the history of St. Michael Church. God is calling us to take courageous steps forward. Together we will build a future where the kingdom of God can be seen and known in new ways. As the psalmist says, send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. A reading from 2 Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 1 through 3, chapter 30, verse 1, and verses 10 through 27. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, just as his ancestor David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah, and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. So the couriers went from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, and as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn, and mocked them. Only a few from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. The hand of God was also on Judah, to give them one heart to do what the king and the officials commanded by the word of the Lord. Many people came together in Jerusalem to keep the festival of unleavened bread in the second month, a very large assembly. They set to work and removed the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars for offering incense they took away and threw them into the Wadi Kidron. They slaughtered the Passover lamb on the fourteenth day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed, and they sanctified themselves and brought burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. They took their accustomed posts according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests dashed the blood that they received from the hands of the Levites. For there were many in the assembly who had not sanctified themselves. Therefore the Levites had to slaughter the Passover lamb for everyone who was not clean, to make it holy to the Lord. For a multitude of the people, many of them from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover otherwise than as prescribed. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon all who set their hearts to seek God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even though not in accordance with the sanctuary's rule of cleanliness. The Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. The people of Israel who were present at Jerusalem kept the festival of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, accompanied by loud instruments for the Lord. Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good skill in the service of the Lord. So the people ate the food of the festival for seven days sacrificing offerings of well-being, and giving thanks to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Then the whole assembly agreed together to keep the festival for another seven days. So they kept it for another seven days with gladness. For King Hezekiah of Judah gave the assembly a thousand bulls and seven thousand sheep for offerings, and the officials gave the assembly a thousand bulls and ten thousand sheep. The priests sanctified themselves in great numbers. The whole assembly of Judah, the priests and the Levites, and the whole assembly that came out of Israel, and the resident aliens who came out of the land of Israel, and the resident aliens who lived in Judah, rejoiced. There was great joy in Jerusalem. For since the time of Solomon, son of King David, of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Then the priests and the Levites stood up and blessed the people, and their voice was heard. Their prayer came to his holy dwelling in heaven. Here ends the reading. My parents recently moved into my grandmother's old house, 
and have been slowly renovating, remodeling, redoing, repainting, re-everything to this house. And I get near-daily pictures of their progress. A newly painted porch, a brand new room addition, a thankfully redone downstairs restroom, new light fixtures. Now, sometimes I get a picture and think, oh my goodness, what are you doing? At one point, they had a plan to cut windows into a brick wall. But after many months, I received an answered prayer that their contractor said it was load-bearing, so it was a no-go. Thank the Lord, because I thought it was going to look awful. This kind of rebuilding takes time, and it takes a commitment to see through the end of projects. It requires living with the mess of one room after the other being disorganized, sometimes ripped to shreds. And we might think that when the boxes are all unpacked, when everything is finally done, that the rebuilding and renovation is over. Except that it isn't. There's more that happens when the building is done. We see this in the lesson we just read from Second Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles are the last books of the Hebrew Bible, and they anticipate in history the return of the people to the land of Israel. The story here begins in the land of Judah, during the reign of King Hezekiah. His rule was marked by a desire to restore the temple of the Lord, which had fallen into disrepair over the years. The temple was a place of worship, a symbol of faith, and a cornerstone of the people's identity. And King Hezekiah recognized that rebuilding this sacred place was essential not only for the present, but also for the future generations. So he didn't hesitate. He recognized the urgency of the task. But as good as his plan seemed, he was still even then met with resistance, with only a few members of the tribes joining Hezekiah in Jerusalem, at first to keep the Passover at the temple. Others mocked and scorned him. They laughed at his idea. It is in the midst of this mocking that God does something. Verse 12 is the turning point. It reads, The hand of God was also on Judah, to give them one heart, to do what the king and the officials commanded by the word of the Lord. This is a profound moment. Despite the initial resistance and division, God intervenes, touching the hearts of the people. It's a reminder that unity is often born out of a divine touch, a shared purpose, and a recognition of our common bond as human beings. In the context of building for the future, Unity is essential. Whether it's our families, communities, or organizations, a shared vision can bring people together in powerful ways. That unity gathered the people together to celebrate Passover. Their act of worship and dedication paved the way for restoration and renewal. It's a beautiful reminder that as we come together in faith and commitment, new things can emerge renewed relationships, revived passions, and the restoration of what was once broken. We can see in the final verse of this passage the fruit of their unity and worship. It reads, So there was great joy in Jerusalem. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, to heaven. The joy that filled Jerusalem was not just a result of a restored temple, but a reflection of the unity and devotion of the people. When we work together, worship together, and share a vision, there is immense joy to be found. The vision is beyond the building and mess of moving. There's more that happens when the building is done. And so I have to return to thinking about my parents renovating my grandmother's house. Because once everything is finished, when the last coat of paint dries, when the final piece of furniture is put into place just so, 
that is when we all get to see the house in a new way. It's the same place, and within it are decades of memories and meals and holidays. The spaces are familiar, but now they are given new life. Now they are ready for decades more of future holidays and future memories for new generations that live side by side with the past. That is what building things is about, creating a space that houses the past and the future together, a space that holds memory and ambition together, a space that readies those who use it now to go and become the people God has called them to be, and to experience the kind of unity that can only come from a divine touch. As we build together for the future, we keep in mind all that God will do in the community that is yet to come, and all the ways that people will be brought together and find new meaning, all the ways that we will be part of the future. Building is just the beginning. There's more that happens when the building is done. Amen. Please join me as we continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.